never a dull moment in Cape Town. We're not even an hour late. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Uta Lehmann, and I'm director of the School of Public Health. It is very nice to welcome everybody to our annual Jets Travel Award Ceremony, albeit belated. Apparently the problem is that there is a fault at one of our power, Steenbrass power station, which has led to, it seems, quite widespread outages, not just here, not just on campus, not just in Belleville. So um, our team has rigged up the generator very quickly, so thanks, big thank you to them for doing that very quickly, so that we can actually be here, um, and I believe we are even able to stream now, so that's great. So you're sitting slightly in the dark, but I'm sure that's survivable. Um, welcome everybody for being here. Welcome to everybody online, um, either live now or if all else fails, recorded and uploaded afterwards. But I know there are lots of friends of the school, alumni of the school, possibly family members, um, who are following um, events online, which is one of the big things we learned during COVID, which is lovely. A special welcome to Diana Yacht from the Mauerberger Foundation. Um, special welcome to the Rector, thanks for coming. Unfortunately, we had hoped that um, Jake Harold's son Hein and his wife Phoebe would be here, but they are not well, so couldn't join us today, so that's a pity. Um, but of course, we are thinking of them. And of course, a particular welcome to our awardee today, uh, Randy Tsahu and his wife. It is really nice to have you here. Um, it is, I mean, we are delighted to have the Jake's Travel Awards every year. Um, I must say, I've been thinking about Jake's quite a lot recently um, in the context of what's going on nationally and internationally in terms of whether it's a lack of leadership and, and integrity, um, the sort of climate crisis that, no, that seems to spin more and more out of control and there's no leadership to actually start taking action, more and more horrendous armed conflicts all over the world and on the continent. And yeah, sort of finding your compass in all of that and not losing hope and not getting paralyzed is something that isn't always easy to do. And I do think a lot about those people like Jake, who in the 1970s and 80s, under of course very different circumstances in the country, um, had to also find their compass, lead, um, figure out what integrity means in this context, stay very, very serious that the threat and uncertainty in the face and continue leading. Um, so I have been thinking about what does Jake's legacy mean in all of that? Um, what does his role and what he did here and more widely in the country continue to teach us, how, does, how can it inspire us, um, and how, how can we, what can we still take from that in terms of not getting paralyzed, being able to take a stand in a way that's meaningful, um, and, and continue the way forward with some sort of help, um, which I think is really, really important. So, the, 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 the memory of Jakes is always important on this context, it's always particularly important when we have these events, and I think it's particularly significant in the time that we live in at the moment. Let me uh, tell you a little bit, I think you've all seen the programs, but very briefly um, we'll have a short video that we put together during COVID um, for our, our um, event. Um, then we will have a few reflections from Diana, and, and I've also asked the rector to uh, say a few words since he's good enough to come. Um, then uh, a 
brief address um, virtually from one of the two nominators of this year's awardee, um, and then uh, Professor Brian van Weyck, who is the other nominator, will read the citation, um, and then we will hear from the awardee himself, um, and then we'll do the thanks. So could we have the um, Jake Starbull video now? It's about, I think, four or five minutes long, so not very long, just reminding us. Jake Scherwell, described as a humble leader, academic and businessman of note. His life was celebrated in a variety of ways which included art, music, literature and film. A number of debates and lectures were also held throughout the day. Scherwell is known for leading from the back, but well-known photographer Rashid Lombard managed to capture the late professor in critical moments in the volatile 1980s. Out of the vast archives, I tried to find him in certain places. And as you can see, the, he's there, but the caption is about the moment in time. And I think it's so important that these moments only come once. And if it's not captured, it's gone. Uh, that's why I always tell people, use your camera and capture a moment in time, be it of children or family. So, you know, and this is my tribute to him. Um, and from... Um, donating it to his wife Phoebe and to the foundation and this will go into his house in Somerset East. While Kharval was remembered for his impeccable work in the political realm and in society, to his family he was a loving husband and father. As my relationship with him, um, our greatest bond was just being able to talk about what was going on in the world and to share life in, in the context of cricket. I mean, that was the one bond that we shared for most of our lives. Kharvel died in November 2012, but his legacy and the immense contribution he played in society lives on. No more to Sabrandle, SABC News, Cape Town. Op 5 juni 1987 wordt hij director en vicekanselier van de Universiteit van de Westkaap. In zijn intrede heeft hij beklemtoon dat die universiteit onder zijn leiding toegewijd zal wees aan die waardes van kritische onerig ingesteldheid. Indien teenstand hierteen politisch of ideologisch van aard is, zal hij dit als opvoeder en administrateur met zijn volle hart teenstaan. De UWK zou so een leier in die strijd word tegen apartheid. Zijn grootste bijdrage tot die transformatie van Zuid-Afrika was die jaren wat hij aan IWK was. Het is waar die groot of, uh, rol wat hij gespeeld heeft was daar, want dit was die begin in, uh, van uh, een proces waarin die universiteit een, een beslissende rol tot een groot mate een beslissende rol gespeeld heeft in die, uh, die veranderingen wat in Zuid-Afrika plaatsvindt. Het. En daarin was het hy een baie fundamentele rol gespeeld. UWK als etnische universiteit het een ander richting ingeslaan als wat die overhede daar die tijd vir die universiteit in gedachte gehad het. Dit zou vernieuwing tafel toe bring. Ik denk mensen de onthou UWK dikwijls voor die optochten en die studenten opstanden en die meer. Ik denk eindelijk waar meer aan die intellectuele bijdrage wat die universiteit gemaakt het. Dat ik het um, op een slag in die periode genoem dat men schraaf wil zien IWK als een intellectual home of the left. IWK was niet net de plek waar vrijheid verskans was nie. Ook die plek waar die toekomst beplan is. As jy weet wat die intellectuele gesprek was, was het was woelig, het was um, levendig, het was uitdagend. En, uh, ja, nee, IWK was baie beslissen. Een belangrijke stem en een belangrijke rol spelen. Feit is, als je nou maar denkt aan die grondwet, na 1990, het ons die voorrecht gehad om een klomp um, of een hele paar um, 
struggle intellectual bij de universiteit te krijgen. Mensen als Kader Asman, Albi Sachs, Dalla Omar, Zola Squihia, hele klompen daar in onze community law center kom uh, werk, klas via en navolging doen. En heel wat van die werk rondom die grondwet is daar gedoen, daar uit die WK uitgekomen. Um, so ja, neem het een baie belangrike rolspeler. I do think we need a lot more again of these fierce and lively debates. They were what brought me here initially and actually have kept me here for a very, very long time. Can I ask the Anne Jach, who is the chairperson of the Mauerberger Foundation? The Mauerberger Foundation has been supporting, has been endowing this award and also supporting the school since 2012. And we are incredibly grateful, continue to be grateful for this support. I want to talk a little bit about her reflections about Jess. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm really, really pleased to be here with, I was going to say old comrades, but um, making new friends as well, um, and always uh, meeting exciting individuals, all of whom are dedicated to making a difference in this world. So thank you very much for asking me to say a few words. Um, I think Uta has said that um, Jake's lived through different times to what we're going through today. But we are faced very much with weak leadership, wars, displaced populations, rampant populism, unbridled capitalism, and the ominous shadow climate change. All of these loom large. And we find ourselves yearning for the wisdom and courage of leaders who faced adversity with unwavering moral strength. And one of these people was Jakes Herwell, whose legacy serves as a guiding light in our tumultuous present. So Jake's legacy isn't simply something relegated to the past, but in my view it is a timeless beacon, illuminating, and illuminating is probably a good word today, uh, shedding light on our path forward. In the face of crises he exhibited unparalleled courage and moral fortitude. His teachings resonate with us today, in particular his lessons that he's left us about leadership and humanity. Amid weak leadership, Jake's life stands as a testament to the transformative power of strong, principled guidance. He demonstrated that true leadership wasn't about wielding authority, but embrace, embracing empathy, compassion, and inclusivity. In a world plagued by war and displacement, Jake's commitment to dialogue and understanding becomes a poignant reminder that peace is not merely the absence of conflict, but is heralded by the presence of justice and harmony. As a matter of interest, when I was reflecting on his contribution today, I remembered that Jakes joined the Moorberger Foundation Fund Board in 1986. And at that time, as we saw and as we know, he was the dynamic head of the Afrikaans department at UWC, whose radical approach to Afrikaans language and literature exploded the orthodoxies that were preached at Afrikaans universities. Jakes was outspoken and radical in his opinions and not one to shy away from expressing them. The year 1986 was the beginning of the state of emergency, a police state in all but name, with frequent outbreaks of public violence, bombings, and thousands in detention or in hiding. 
Jake's made radical changes to UWC, including opening it to all races in defiance of its coloreds only charter and turning it into a hotbed of opposition politics. Perhaps only his public stature and his popularity among the students and staff protected him from arrest. With the release of Nelson Mandela four years later, Jakes was elected to the ANC Western Cape leadership. Although health was not his field and UWC did not have a medical school, he identified the need for grassroots intervention in this area. And all of you know that public health had been a very divisive issue in South Africa, where resources were concentrated in the white cities of major, of major areas and were sparse to non-existent in rural uh, black areas. Public health scares around contagious diseases had also provided useful cover to justify demolition of informal black settlements. Jakes convened a conference in which he invited academics, activists, health professionals to discuss the principles and processes needed to establish a new non-racial democratic health system. So, as, as we grapple with many of the challenges that face us today, I think Jake's legacy serves as a reminder that resilience and moral courage are not relics of the past, but virtues we must cultivate and embody today. Before concluding, I just wanted to offer a few reflections on the significance of this award to public health. To date, I am pleased to say that we are honoured that there have been 10 recipients of this award, which recognises those who have made a significant impact on public health through leadership and innovation. All those individuals have come from very different countries, backgrounds and experiences, but what they have in common is passion and dedication. And more than that, they have the organizational and diplomatic skills to devise solutions and negotiate changes to health systems at the highest levels. And they hone these skills, studying at University of Western Cape's School of Public Health, which continues to nurture and inspire practitioners, scholars, and researchers today. In conclusion, let us draw inspiration from Jake Skirwell's enduring legacy. Let us emulate his courage, his compassion, and unwavering commitment to justice. By doing so, we can forge a future that is not defined by the crises we face but by the strength of our character and depth of our humanity. In Jake's words, hope is not about the future, it's about what we do today. Thank you. Thanks, Diana. Those are really, really inspiring and appropriate words. Um, and now I'd like to ask our rector, who has links going to at UWC, with UWC and with Jake, to actually go back further than mine, which by now is quite a feat, <laughs> to say a few words. Thanks, Professor Petrovius. Thank you, Professor Vadimir. I was ambushed. I thought I could sneak in, just listen to the lecture and think a little bit about Jake's while uh, listening to the, uh, to the lecture, but uh, unfortunately Prof. Lehman spotted me and decided that I must speak to you unprepared. So I want to uh, uh, welcome all of you to this uh, event, in particular Ms. Diana Yaf from the Marlborough Foundation, 
Diana, UWC is very grateful for your continued personal support as well as the support of the Marvel Worker Foundation for a, for a variety of initiatives within the university. Also to welcome the latest recipient of the Jet Scarborough Award, Dr. Landry Dongmo. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Thank you. <coughs> Um, the School of Public Health is synonymous with Jake's uh, and, and when Jake's had a program or an initiative uh, that he wanted to explore, he was very single-mindedly focused on that. He believed that uh, uh, while many were pressuring him, uh, I was a dean at the time that he was rector, in fact I was dean of community and health sciences, and while many were pressuring, pressurizing him uh, to consider a medical school, uh, because we were, we were the only university in the Western Cape that did not have a medical school, he was firm in his opinion uh, that tertiary and secondary care uh, in, in, in South Africa uh, have asked or were skewed in, in favor uh, of the more privileged, as Ms. Yak also said, and he believed that we needed a school of public health uh, that could promote primary health care in South Africa. Now, Jakes had a very different idea of what the School of Public Health he was going to look like. It was going to be a virtual school, not a physical school. It was going to be virtual and it was going to draw on already existing healthcare professionals in the other departments. The virtual school would have a director but no staff because the staff would be the existing staff in the other healthcare departments. I wonder what James would say about public health now and what it has become and what it has achieved. Despite these many honors and despite the standing that he enjoys in South African society, James was a very, very humble person. You could immediately pick that up from the video. He never speaks about his role. He gives all the credit to UWC. I remember when, when Monash University uh, in Australia uh, honored him with an honorary doctorate. A few months after that, uh, he was in, he, he was going to deliver a lecture and um, the MC introduced him and then mentioned that uh, uh, Prof. Harrell just received an honorary doctorate from, from um, Monash University. And he was very dismissive about it. When he came to the podium, he said, you know, I have a real doctorate as well, not just the, the honorary doctorate. Jake was also a principled man and a man with integrity. Um, when, when I spoke on behalf of the 15 year recipients of long service awards, I was asked to see, speak on behalf of those recipients. I related a very personal story uh, about what I learned from Jake's. So I was, I was a young dean. Uh, I think I became dean at 30 years of age. And Jake's had his own staff cricket team. Now, most of those staff were fairly middle-aged 
And I was drafted by Jakes into this team because I was young and I could run around the rugby field. And then all they would do is they would shout, if the ball goes there, they would shout, Tyrant! Then I had to run there. Tyrant! And then I had to run there. Now, I then applied, I think, to become uh, uh, a professor. I was associate professor, I applied to become a professor. And I thought, I've got the inside track, I'm on Jakes' cricket team. Surely they can't refuse me. I then discovered what integrity and principles meant. Even though Jake's chaired the, the appointments committee, I didn't get it. And afterwards he gave him feedback, which the chair, chair of the appointments committee is supposed to do. He gave him feedback on why I didn't get it. And it had nothing to do with cricket, and it had everything to do with where my shortcomings was. I try in many ways uh, to take personal lessons uh, from Jakes. Uh, he used to invite me for, for Friday night red wine sessions. We would talk, we would talk about everything and not about UWC. And from him I learned the importance of work-life balance. This, this job can be quite consuming unless you draw boundaries and unless you maintain a healthy balance between work and between life. I could probably go on and on to share the personal lessons that I've learned from Jake's, but this I'd like to close by saying that the foundations of this university and its achievements um, up to now, those foundations were laid by Jake Scherber. What we are today as a university is because of Jake Scherber. What we are today as a nation is because of the absence of the Jake Scarabots of this world. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Professor Pretorius. I know you don't like to be ambushed, but now you know why I did. Um, it's a reminder, it's a history lesson. I've forgotten about the school, public health schools without walls. Indeed. Indeed, it was an important part of the original mission. We have retained some of it by having a very, very wide continental student ship. But yeah, we have these walls, and I would love to tear some of them down and open things up. But yeah, it, life happens, and history happens and changes. Thank you very much um, to both speakers for their reflections. Um, we are now going to shift focus a little bit, um, as I said, and shift our attention to this year's awardee, quite appropriately, and we will start with a brief video message from um, Professor Deborah Jackson, who was um, one of the supervisors of, of Landry's PhD. She was also for many, many years a, a colleague here at the School of Public Health then went to UNICEF and is now at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, um, is the Takeda Chair of Global Child Health, which is her area of specialization. But while doing all of that, she's also retained her link with the school. She's always supervised students, even when she had left. Um, she comes back regularly. Um, so it's a it's wonderful to have her connected and she has an incredible contribute has made an, and continues to do, make an incredible contribution to the school. So brief input from her. Thank you. Dear UWC colleagues and friends, I am so excited to be here today to celebrate Dr. Landry Zag and Professor Jake Skirwell. I am sorry I could not be there in person. I supervise Landry's PhD at University of the Western Cape. 
We first met working on the evaluation of the prevention of mother to child transmission program in Rwanda. From that work, Landry completed his PhD research on the PMTCT cascades, which were instrumental in monitoring PMTC programs for protecting infants across Africa from HIV. Landry has gone on to be an HIV and public health expert, taking his experience and insight across Africa, as you will see in his lecture. As professor and Takeda chair in global child health at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and co-director of the Center for Maternal, Adolescent, Reproductive and Child Health, I have, I have proudly maintained my affiliation with the University of the Western Cape School of Public Health. LSHTM has strong ties with the SOPH. This week I had dinner with colleagues and a PhD student from UWC here in London as they were collaborating with LSHTM colleagues on a joint maternal health quality of care project in rural KwaZulu-Natal. Prof. Gerwell was an author, teacher, leading intellectual, member of the ANC and director general in the presidential office of Nelson Mandela. He was a thought leader for a new Africa and Landry exemplifies the spirit as he supports the Africa Center for Disease Control, which since 2017 is leading the way for protecting and promoting the health of all Africans. In reading his bio, I noted Prof Gerwal's successful negotiation with Libya to release the suspects of the bombing of the Lockerbie Pan Am Airways flight on behalf of Nelson Mandela, in an effort to promote peace and healing in the face of tragedy. I am hopeful for new leaders like Prof Gerwal and Nelson Mandela and Bishop Tutu, former chancellor of UWC, to emerge from Africa to lead us in promoting peace and human rights across Africa and the world. I am proud to know Dr. Tseg and celebrate the University of the Western Cape in the proud history of Professor Jake Skirwell. Thank you, and I hope and assume that Deborah is actually following online. And now I would like to invite Professor Brian van Beek um, to read the citation for Andrew. Thank you. Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, it's my privilege to read the citation for Andy Sege. Close to half a century ago, in a small town named Kuseri in Cameroon, a baby boy, a baby boy was living with rather a rather quiet childhood. Dr. Sege was far from imagining that as a teenager, his generation would witness the devastating impact of the AIDS epidemic at a time when stigma was very high and antiretroviral treatment was almost non-existent in Africa. As a teenager, he witnessed his peers in Cameroon, the release on February 11, 1990, after 27 years of jail of Nelson Mandela, the first president of the Democratic South Africa, and at the end of the apartheid regime. His passion for medicine was sparked by the experience of his mother, who became an orphan as a teenager when her mother died giving birth. By the time he completed his medical studies, it was clear he would focus his passion and intellect on solving his generation's most challenging public health crisis, the HIV pandemic. His doctoral work focused on a clinical trial to design treatment strategies for oncocytosis control program, also known as river blindness. He then joined the National AIDS Control Program in Cameroon as a young medical doctor to lead the monitoring and evaluation portfolio of the newly established program for preventing mother-to-child transmission of HIV. He was promoted to the newly established post of Chief Medical Officer of the PMTCT program in the Ministry of Health Directorate of Disease Control. He then joined the prestigious Fuge, Fuge Fellowship in Global Health and Leadership program at the Rhodes School of Public Health at Emory University in Atlanta in the United States. His fieldwork in Syria, Kenya focused on the PMTC program's transition to more efficacious ARV regimens. His work was selected for the prestigious Shipping Award of My Scientific Merit of the Rowland School of Public Health. In 2006, 17 years ago, with his friend Dr. Camillo Raul, they designed in Atlanta what is now known as the Pan African Medical Journal, ranking first among the open access medical journals in Africa and one of the most prestigious worldwide. He returned to his motherland, Africa, where he was privileged to contribute to research and programs to advance PMTCT programs in various countries serving in Rwanda, Zambia, Senegal, and Ethiopia. Fourteen years later, 
his PhD work allowed him to reflect on what it would take to achieve universal access to effective PMTCT antiretroviral strategies and prevent African children from dying of AIDS. His work was awarded the Public Health Social Innovation Award. Following his PhD work, Dr. Sege continued to advocate for universal access to lifelong antiretroviral strategies in, in Africa as part of a comprehensive approach to accelerate the elimination of new infections in children and in the pediatric AIDS. In 2019, when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, the HIV pandemic was not yet over. The COVID-19 pandemic uncovered the fragility of the health systems. It exacerbated glaring inequalities between Africa <coughs> and the rest of the world in accessing COVID-19 diagnostics, vaccines, therapeutics, and other essential medical goods. As with the HIV pandemic, Dr. Sega embarked on the COVID-19 response in Africa. He proposes to reflect on the key lessons learned through responding to two, to two pandemics at a new time in history. May have, may have had an issue with the walls. I'm sure he would be very, very proud of all the alumni that, and this alumni in particular. Thanks a lot, Brian. Uh, Diane, I'm going to ask you to now come and hand over the award certificate to say good afternoon and welcome. It's a great honor to receive the Jake's Heaver Award today. The Jake Heaver Award in public health deeply humbles me. I've been thinking about the best way to thank the School of Public Health Faculty, the Mobega Foundation, and of course, all of you, thank you for this 
great, great, great honor you are, you are doing to me. And the best way I saw, I was trying to say thank you in many African languages. I was fortunate to live and work in seven countries on this wonderful continent of ours. So let me try to say thank you in seven African languages. <laughs> yes, I'm sure we're going to learn at least one new language today. So let me start here in South Africa. In Kosa, I would say in Kosi. In Kosi. In Nyanja, from Zambia, I would say Zikomo. In Kinyarwanda, from Rwanda, I would say Murakozi Chani. In Ethiopia, in Amharic, I would say Amesekenani. In Kenya, in Kiswahili, I would say Asante, Asante Sad. In Wolof, from Senegal, I would say Cherish. And then we get back where we all started. In Cameroon, in my mother tongue, Yemba, I would say Mansiaki. And Yemba is only one of the 280 languages spoken. So if you want, I can continue with the other. <laughs> Great. So, I really want to use this opportunity to extend my high strategy to my parents. They invested on the education of their children. And this award is their award. They are my first men. So I want here to express my gratitude to my father, Sagi Vision, and my mother, Sake Marimadre. But I also want to express my deepest gratitude to someone special. I'm trying to move my slide. The next slide. Great. Someone special called my grandmother, the matriarch, Mezamopurin. Mezamopurin left us a month ago. At age 102. She was a blessing to her three generations of children, grandchildren and grandchildren. And what makes Mezamopurin special is her unwavering commitment to education for her education was a non-negotiable investment. I also want to warmly thank my family. My wife, Dimpa Judith, who is here with us. She has been the pillar of the family and a great co-pilot on this journey. I also want to thank our children who are connected. They are on all the social media, I can tell you. They are on TikTok, trying to tweet about this on Twitter. <laughs> I want to thank Zagi Grace, William, Ivan, and Naomi for also being great uh, stewards on our flight and our journey. At this specific time, allow me to make a pause and reflect on one of Jake's heaven philosophy, education. Education was a cornerstone to his philosophy based on what uh, we all uh, learn today. And Prof. Herbert believed in education as a tool for empowerment, fostering critical thinking, creativity, and a sense of social responsibility. So in my journey, I was fortunate to be inspired and empowered by numerous people. The list is not exhaustive, but I want to highlight a few of my mentors who really built who I am today both from the professional side and the academic side. I really want to thank them personally. They are, most of them are connected. A few of them are in the room with us today because they challenged me to always be and to become the best version of myself over the years. This award is also their award. So today I accept this award standing on the shoulders of these public health heroes. 
and citizen world at a time when peace and security in Africa and the world at large are challenged daily by, by armed conflict and war. I accept this award at the time when the world is still recovering from the devastating effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. I accept this award at the time when Africa remains hit, unfortunately, continue to be hard hit by the infectious diseases, HIV, tuberculosis, malaria, and when we are witnessing the devastating impact of climate change with disruption in infrastructure. Agriculture, health systems. Unfortunately, we are seeing diseases like cholera coming back and spreading. I accept this award for all my peers. They are community health workers, they are nurses, doctors. I want to pay special tribute this evening to some of us who did not make it to the COVID 19 pandemic. So, the next slide is coming. Great. So, uh, let me share with you in the next 15 minutes a snapshot of my journey. Uh, I will go through what uh, my PhD work was about and what we learned through the process of tackling uh, the HIV epidemic in children. And then I will go into what I call the collision, uh, a collision between two pandemics. Yes, our generation of public health practitioners experienced an unprecedented time in the history of humanity, the collision of two pandemics, COVID-19 and HIV. I'm going to share with you some of the lessons that we've all learned and how those lessons have shaped the future of public health in Africa. So the next slide. Great. So, uh, my PhD work focused on improving access to more efficacious treatment or strategies to reduce the transmission of HIV from parents to their children. And we did that with Professor Deborah Jackson as one of my uh, supervisors, Professor Liam Babaje, Professor Bodo Timurigacha, working under the leadership of uh, the Rwandan Ministry of Health. Rwanda is one of the most progressive countries in Africa when it comes to HIV prevention uh, and uh, pediatric treatment in children. And what I want to highlight here is that uh, at the time of my PhD, we were still discussing about whether antiviral treatment for pregnant and breastfeeding mothers <coughs> was a feasible strategy in Africa. Rwanda was one of, one of the first countries to not only shift toward a strategy, but also to accelerate the rollout up to uh, the primary health care level. So in our study, what we learned is first, despite the fact that more efficacious treatment were, were, were available at the lower level, the socioeconomic status of some models, especially in our study, young, mothers who were poor with no source of income were less likely to benefit from the intervention for various reasons across the continent of care. And one of our conclusions, I think the most important message from our work, was that if the Africa, if Africa and the world was definitely serious about ending the pediatric epidemic, HIV epidemic and any aging children we will not achieve it without first tackling the weak health system, second addressing the root causes which were keeping women, especially young women, more vulnerable and outside the health system. So, where are we today when it comes to any educated children? Uh, the good news is that over the past decades, we have witnessed remarkable progress in the kids program. I just want to highlight on the far right side of this slide, you can see in yellow that more and more women since 2010 are receiving more efficacious treatment regimen. Unfortunately, you can also see at the same time that 
children, treatment for children in green is still lagging behind treatment of women. Why is this the case? The second message of this slide is that Africa continues to be hardly hit when it comes to new age infection in children. We need to fix this. The good news is that when it comes to ending pediatric in children, we have Botswana. Botswana is the first country, high HIV epidemic, but today Botswana has been certified by WHO as the first country on the path to eliminate pediatric HIV in Africa. And we know that it's so run out for. The second good message is that on the far right part side of this slide, the world has come together around the coalition, the coalition to end AIDS in children. And that coalition, we really hope that it will generate the necessary political commitment to address, as I mentioned earlier, the structural barriers across the continent, those barriers which are keeping most vulnerable women from benefiting from the most efficacious regime available today. But we also are conscious that the COVID-19 pandemic has strengthened some of the progress that we see today. So the next part of my presentation, next slide, is to really focus on how does the collision between the COVID-19 pandemic and the HIV pandemic has affected uh, our world. Before dwelling into that, I just want to take a step back and share with you these basic principles of uh, pandemic prevention, preparedness response that I borrowed from one of my mentors, Dr. John Kinderson. So the five P's. The first P is about the pathogens. You need to know which pathogen you are dealing with and how that pathogen is affecting uh, uh, people, human beings, the pathogenesis. The second P the populations. Who are the people who are the most affected? And uh, who are those who are uh, ending with the poor, poorest outcome when they are affected? The third P is about the policy and programs. What are the evidence-based policy and programs that need to be implemented to uh, uh, counter the, the, the current pandemic we are dealing with? The fourth P is partnerships. Yes, without partnership, nothing great has ever been achieved in this world. So we need partnership at community, at country, at continental, at global level when dealing with pandemics. And the last P is politics. Yes, politics can make it or break it. And good public health is also about good politics for the common good. So now let's dwell into the coalition. The next slide. Uh, this slide somehow summarizes uh, our understanding of what happened. It's not exhaustive, definitely, but it's a way to capture the effect of the coalition between the COVID-19 and the HIV pandemic at individual level, at community level, at country level, at the continental level, and then at global level. I think the first message here is that uh, we all know COVID-19 has hardly hit those who were the most vulnerable, either due to their age or their immune status. And people with HIV, unfortunately, were among those hardly hit by the pandemic. Especially on the other continent, because at the time of the pandemic, we did not have available, pretty available, uh, the most potent therapy, including uh, monoclonal antibodies or, or antiviral, uh, antiviral for the COVID-19 uh, uh, severe cases. We also know that the pandemic exacerbated mental health issues, not only because we were living more and more in isolation, but we were very much anxious about tomorrow. There were a lot of uncertainties. A lot of uncertainties. We are well aware of the fact that because of the lockdowns, because of travel bans, 
because of supply disruptions at country, continental and global level. There were disruptions in the provision of routine services. In some countries, we have recorded a backsliding in the coverage of childhood vaccination. And by the end of 2021, it was estimated that 12 million children on the continent had missed at least one dose of vaccines against childhood, preventable childhood diseases. COVID-19 pandemic, as we all know, brought forward at continental level one sad reality. Africa did not have the capacity at the time of the pandemic to produce COVID-19 vaccines when that technology became available. And when vaccines were available globally, Africa was among the last to receive the COVID-19 vaccines. That inequity in access to vaccines was one of the sad experiences that we all lived through during the pandemic. The other message that I want to highlight here is about the positive side. I want to put it that way, positive side in terms of the lessons. The first is that we saw the power of community health workers. They became more and more effective in ensuring the continuity of services at community level because they are there in our community with us. They needed to be protected in doing that job. And today we have more countries on the continent moving forward, institutionalizing, equipping, protecting, and dignifying the cap of healthcare workers, the community healthcare workers, because we saw how effective and relevant they are on our health system. The second reality is that uh, in Africa, we invested during the pandemic in strengthening our laboratory systems. Today, the continent is able to detect uh, new pathogens more rapidly and design strategies because of our capacity in uh, uh, genomics. The third point is genomic sequencing not only equip our lab system to detect, but we have to acknowledge the fact that uh, uh, we have more and more capacity to des design new vaccines because of the mRNA technology. Today on the continent, we have about five centers of excellence for mRNA-based uh, vaccine development. One of them is in South Africa. And this capacity is definitely going to, to remain and to allow the continent to be better prepared for the next pandemic. I also want to highlight the fact that uh, we have seen the global solidarity more active. Initiatives like the COVAX the COVID-19 vaccine delivery partnerships at global level and initiatives at continental level led by the African Union and African CDC, like the African Union Vaccine Acquisition Trust, ABAT, and the Saving Lives and Livelihood programs, all contributed to increase access to COVID-19 vaccines to people in need on the continent. So, the collision at global level uncover the challenges in the global architecture and when addressing global health crisis we all understood that we needed to fix things and this has led to what's going on now at global level around the, the amendment of the international health regulations on the one hand and on the other hand on what the WHO has uh, proposed as the pandemic treaty or pandemic accord which is undergoing negotiation. So, the COVID-19 and HIV collision has had, as, as I, I just described, far-reaching impacts on individuals, communities, countries, the continent of Africa, and the world. So, how do we move forward? 
my next slide. So let me make a pause here and highlight Africa CDC, the Africa Center for Disease Control, which was established by the African Head of State in 2017 as an autonomous institution of the African Union in charge of the health security of the continent. So Africa CDC is definitely going to play a key role moving forward, has played a key role during the COVID-19 pandemic and will play a more important role moving, much more important role moving forward. The vision that was established by Africa CDC is that Africa needs a new public health order. And that new order is encapsulated under the, uh, the five pillars that are described on this slide. So let me just go through each of the pillars for you to understand what is it about the new vision of Africa CDC to prepare Africa for the next pandemic. The first one is that we need in Africa a strengthened national public health institutions that country at each country's level at a continental level through Africa cities to guide priorities, coordinate policies and programs, and drive standard setting for disease and disease organisms. The second, we need strengthened public health workforce and leadership. This will require to expand the catch of community health workers, particularly, as well as training more leaders in public health to face the challenges of our time and the challenges of truth. We need Af Africa to engage into respectful and action-oriented partnerships. As I told you, not integrating the world has ever been done without strong partnerships. We need to expand the capacity to produce vaccines, therapeutics, diagnostics, locally on the continent. We learned it through the COVID-19 pandemic. And we need to increase Yes, we need money for this to happen. But we need government, African governments, to increase domestic, financial investment into health. But one could say, but yes, this is all good, but how do we do that? So let me share with you some of my reflections uh, to end this session. I've captured seven important messages. And those messages somehow highlight what I think will make a difference, especially on those two pillars that I uh, highlighted with a star. The first message is that it will take political leadership to drive the whole of government and whole of society approach to change the narrative. Yes, there's a need for narrative change on the continent when it comes to health, we talk about health expenditure. We need to change the narrative and talk about health investing. Second, it will take African leaders to honor their commitments. Yes, our leaders agreed in 2001 that they will allocate 15% of their gross domestic uh, uh, product to health. And do you know where we are today? The lowest is at 0.2%, the highest is around 2%. We can do more, we can do better. Third, it will take global solidarity to revisit the global financing and aid architecture. Yes, because we need to reduce the tension on our domestic resources and our, domestic, our, and our budget, especially uh, the budget of most of the African countries hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. Four, it will take Africa and the global community to embrace the investment in health security as a necessary condition if we want to harness the greatest potential or the unprecedented potential of first, the African continental free trade area, second, the African Union protocol on free movement of persons in Africa. We need health security as a precondition for economic growth and prosperity. 
Fifth, it will take young African innovators. Yes, you are in the room. It will take you to step in. It will take you to leverage the power of new technology, the power of generative artificial intelligence, to drive drug discovery, to drive vaccine development, to drive the capacity on the continent that will prepare us better for the next, the current first and then the next pandemics. It will take the whole of government approach to secure reliable internet access. Sustainable energy supply. Yes. You hear me, right? It will take trade health workforce and enabling policy integration if you want to respond to current pandemics and better prepared for the next pandemics. Finally, the seventh last message that I have is that it will take a renewed global cooperation that upholds the values of multilaterals to foster the African citizen that I shared with you. It will lastly call on all of us Next, it will call on all of us to embrace the Ubuntu philosophy. This philosophy was dear to Professor James Heaven and President Nelson Mandela. This philosophy says, I am because we are. I am because we are. The Ubuntu philosophy epitomizes the belief that our well-being is interconnected with others' well-being. And that we all prosper by caring for one another. Let's embrace the Ubuntu philosophy if we want to collectively overcome the complex challenges of our time. I thank you. inspiring and informative and wonderful address and lecture. Um, really nice to hear about your own work and your own history, but, but then also get a sense of what's been happening in the last couple of years um, in terms of the, the pulling together and the trajectory of Africa, the AU, thinking together about a new public health order. I think that is very hopeful and very important and inspiring work that's happening and it's wonderful that you are so part of that and inspiring for all our students, all our alumni and um, it bodes well, I think, for this new public order. I'm wondering whether there are a couple of um, questions or contributions that people want to make. Blown away. Bobby. Yeah, I just wanted to say congratulations to uh, Lanry uh, for this much deserved uh, award. Uh, congratulations. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, so, uh, a quick question uh, on what you presented to the, uh, the African CDC perspective uh, and how to think about change in the continent. And my question relates to the issue of increasing domestic uh, financial investment for, for Africa, for health. Uh, and having worked in several African countries with governments uh, and also international agencies, I just want to ask where you think is the problem or what your insight is as to what the issues are. Because on the one hand, you have uh, a situation where countries do not have uh, resources uh, to invest in health. On the other hand, it's the issue of prioritization. So we'd like to hear your thoughts uh, on what you think is the underlying problem in that regard. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you 
you so much for it. I still remember our time in 2014-15. We were sharing the same corridor as PhD students. And I still remember our conversations at that time about health systems strengthening. And it's, it's amazing how health financing, which was already a challenge at that time, remains a challenge today. Uh, let me start by saying that uh, the political momentum that we have seen throughout the COVID-19 response among uh, African heads of state is an illustration of how much health has become one of the national priorities on the agenda. And also how the conversation about health is shifting from spending on the social sector to invest on a precondition for African countries and the continent to move towards prosperity, to move towards economic growth, to move towards the well-being of their citizens. And I think when you look closely at the new public health order, the head of state clearly articulated the pillars with a clear understanding that domestic investment is definitely the foundation we need to invest if we have stronger health institutions, if we want protected, dignified workforce, if we want to be able to produce locally our diagnostic, our vaccines, our therapeutic, and we need as a continent to have partnerships. We are not going to live in isolation with the rest of the world. Partnerships with the rest of the world. And that's where uh, there's a lot of discussion around restructuring the financial architecture. Because on one hand, uh, you need to acknowledge that countries are facing tensions around what is called the fiscal space. The fiscal, the fiscal space has reduced, and even further during the COVID-19 pandemic, where as a result of all uh, the shocks that I described, it was definitely recession. So today, the question of investing into health has somehow been compounded by the reduction of the fiscal space and the realization that health is a critical space or area of investment. The head of state definitely they have a solution. It takes leadership. It takes the definition of priority, and we are all definitely as public health experts called to bring to those decision makers, timely, the policy and evidence-based strategies that they need to invest in. That's our role. Thank you. of investment, what do you think will be the role of the private sector uh, within the African continent to be able to tap into the investment, in particular as we, uh, with the new public order in terms of manufacturing, vaccine, uh, medicine and so on. Um, yeah, what's your take on that? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Jenny, for this Quite a tough question. Uh, my first insight is that uh, it takes partnerships as part of the new public health order to realize that vision. And private sector is definitely a key actor uh, in the vision of the African Union and African citizen to change the narrative. Because in the private sector you have innovation, you have vibrant entrepreneurship. But you also have what I call capital. One of the challenges that we are facing on as a continent is the challenge of uh, capital investment in everything we want to do. I mentioned the young people, I want to mention young innovators. So the private sector will have to play a key role 
in creating the space for young innovators to come on board, in creating the opportunities for the young people to take the role in realizing the new public health order. The private sector will have a role to play with the university because we need the university to champion each of the five pillars. Yes, governments alone will not make it, communities alone will not make it. I think, I'm just reflecting again at the time when Poso, which uh, uh, was talking about his time with Poso, Jake's head. If Poso Jake was here today, how would he approach our challenges? How would we convince the head of state to invest into help? How will we bring the private sector to play a role? I think it's going to be about us, public health professionals, to get out, to go and speak up to them. Because sometimes it takes a conversation to change the world. Thank you. Treatment 
where it started all over the world. We didn't have solutions, but on the continent. Doctors, nurses, community workers, they played a role. And we cannot underestimate your contribution in reducing the worst outcome for the African people. They played a role. We also have to acknowledge that on our continent, many people died. Yes. We lost friends, brothers, family members, colleagues. So, the pandemic hardly hit Africa. We cannot underestimate what we went through. That's the continent. The question that we have now, Sam, just to reflect on that important point we made, is are we going to be better prepared when the next collision happens? I don't want to say the next pandemic hit because we haven't fixed the actual pandemic, right? We haven't fixed it. We are so that right. When the next collision happens, are we going to be better prepared, Sandro? That's the question that we are trying to answer. Thank you. I think that's an important question and to, to end on. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to, oh yes, so I want to thank our alumnus, Dr. Nandi Sagu, for a inspiring, forward-looking, um, really interesting um, and African perspective um, on building a new order, on the importance of people, partnerships, relationships and politics in being able to build that order. I think that is something we often tend to underestimate. Um, and obviously in that there are the continental politics and I think I, I agree during the COVID pandemic there was a lot of very impressive solidarity on the continent that others can learn from. But of course there are also continuing huge inequities and equalities between the North and the South and across the continent. So there's a huge agenda that um, we all have to tackle. And I think the, the issue of domestic investment is one of the key issues that keeps coming up at every meeting that I've been to recently. I think we're really lagging with implementation in that regard. Um, I'm diverting slightly from the program because when I was um, driving in today, I realized that this is in fact my last public event as director of the School of Public Health. So I decided I want to say some thank yous. Um, it's been wonderful to have these events every year for the last, I think it's more than 10 years. Um, so, I want to start by thanking Diana and the Malvern Foundation for wonderful financial support, but as importantly steadfast, multi-dimensional dimensional support over such a prolonged period of time. I mean, we are all living in, at a time when we are chasing after the next grant and the next project and um, financial sustainability is is difficult and we have to figure out how we do that and then still do the work we want to do. It is really wonderful to have a friend and partner in the Marburger Foundation who keeps telling us that it's good work, keep doing what you're doing. Um, so that's inspiring and helpful and we're really grateful for it. I want to thank Thank the rector for coming. He always comes to our event. He continues to support us, uh, keep an interest. He's been involved with the school from the very beginning when it was a very, very tiny program because, as I said, he was dean at the time. So it's really wonderful to have him come back. Um, then, of course, I want to thank the awardee tonight and his family. Um, firstly, for coming all the way, um, it's, we've travelled far. Um, I know how much family support means when finishing a PhD, so thank you also for your wife coming and coming, and, uh, and your brothers 
and family. Um, then I want to thank all our wonderful students and alumni. Um, the fact that we easily, year after year, can pull out somebody extraordinary and say, this is this year's Jake Strava awardee, both from locally and continentally, just shows what incredible students come to us, honor us by coming to us, and we all say, all of us say that when we teach, we learn as much as we teach, because our students are all over the continent doing incredible professional work um, in very, very different capacities, often in, in government, in ministries of health, but also in NGOs, in, in, in multinational agencies, and so on. And to have that connection is, is very remarkable, and we are doing quite a lot of work at the moment, behind the scenes at the moment, to build the alumni network. So hopefully we will be able to connect people better together and also to connect the school and the university better with, with all our alumni. There are about a thousand by now, so it's, it's quite impressive. And then, of course, I want to thank our team who makes, always makes these events um, run smoothly. I don't know if it is just about saying we will have the event, this is an audit, these are the nominators, and then the team that's consisting of many people makes sure that the venue is set up, the electricity and the Wi Fi and the, and the um, streaming works unless ESCOM has other plans, um, that we have wonderful catering. And that team is led by Tamara Peterson, who's sitting right at the back. And uh, many of you know her. And of course, together with many others, there's Yanda, who always makes sure that we are making our, um, that, that our connectivity works. There's some Trombomzi Buzani who helps out everywhere. She's, I think her official title is receptionist. Nothing could be further from the truth. She does so many more things than that. And of course, Kanita Ernesti, who is our project's senior project coordinator, who holds everything together. Um, so it's an amazing team that makes this school work. Um, I'm deeply grateful to all of them. And then, lastly, I want to introduce to you uh, Professor Olavoka Apintola, who will be Director of the School of Public Health from the 1st of January next year. So, Olavoka, will you please stand up and come to the It is really wonderful that um, he will take over. He has a very, very impressive um, academic record, is a great promoter of health promotion, um, has roots in KZN, in Nigeria and in Canada, um, has been with us now for three years and it's wonderful that he wanted to come to us. I remember very vividly when we advertised the post and Taylor and I looked through, through the CVs, uh, the people that applied, and said, hang on, we both know this man, how come he wants to apply? So it's, yeah, we are very lucky to have him here. Um, he will be a great director, uh, take the school forward. It's an urgent time for new thinking. Um, and um, yeah, I wish you luck in all of that. <laughs> Thank you. Leftover by now refreshments out there, but Ola Volker says he also wants to say something. Thank you, Uda. Um, can I uh, have you stand up and thank someone that has not been thanked for the last 10 years? <laughs> Professor Uta Lima, for an incredible work in the School of Public Health and her service to humanity in the last 10 years and three years before that. And for all she's done in her career as a mother, uh, just a great human being. 